All right. Uh, again, good evening, everybody. Uh, I think we are going to start our presentation now. Uh, I see there are people pouring in the Zoom room, and I appreciate everybody taking time out of their night tonight uh, to come and hear about what we have been doing in order to study uh, our fire station number one, uh, to hear some of the items that we came up with and the recommendations that may be made to the township board, uh, and of course, uh, to be heard and so we can collect your thoughts and feedback as we finalize this plan to be uh, presented to the township board. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to do some brief introductions. For those of you that I have not had a chance to meet before, my name is Ben Swayze. I am the township manager here at Cascade Township. Uh, I hired by the township board uh, to run the day-to-day -day operations. I'm going to ask our other team members to introduce themselves. Uh, Chief Majors, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, Chief Majors, I've uh, been here in Cascade Township going on uh, three and a half years now. Um, so as the fire chief, I'm here to represent uh, some of that aspect. Great. Thank you, Chief. And uh, Jim, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi, my name is Jim Horman. I'm a principal and an architect with Progressive AE. Uh, we've been tasked with studying uh, the fire station as well as the facilities and space needs assessment for Cascade Township. And our assistant township manager, Stephanie Fast, is going to serve as our uh, Zoom moderator tonight. Uh, Steph, could you introduce yourself as well? Sure thing, Ben, although you stole all my lines. I'm Stephanie Fast. <laughs> I'm the assistant manager, and I'll be moderating this evening. Great. Thank you, Steph. Uh, so again, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out tonight. Um, I'm sure over the course of the pandemic, uh, we've gotten more and more used to uh, doing Zoom meetings. Uh, we're happy to provide this information via Zoom. Uh, one of the good things about this process is we have been uh, starting recording our meetings. Uh, so there uh, may be people that are not able to join us tonight at this time. Uh, as soon as this uh, meeting is done, it will be processed by our staff and will be available on our township website uh, along with the survey uh, to gather uh, feedback from tonight's presentation as well. So if we go to the next slide, please. I just wanna talk a little bit about what our agenda is going to be for tonight. So uh, we're gonna start off real quick by just talking a little bit about where we got our priorities from. Uh, and that came from facility study that was completed in 2019, uh, really to give you guys an idea of why we're here tonight talking about this. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the township growth curve. So the township has uh, experienced some significant growth uh, over the past several decades. We'll talk a little bit about that growth curve and the items that the specifically the fire department has done in response to that growth curve and how this next step adds into that ever evolving process. At that point, we're going to do a deeper delve into the facility assessment and prioritization study that was done in 2018 and 2019. And we're gonna focus specifically on fire station one, uh, what the deficiencies were that were identified in this facility uh, what the public had to say about it, and what the opportunities were that were identified. Uh, after we're able to review that, we're really going to get into the heart of the presentation, uh, which is the uh, site select starts with the site selection process. So as part of this process, we uh, reviewed uh, probably close to two dozen potential sites uh, in the township uh, and narrowed it down to the three that you're going to hear about tonight. Uh, and Chief Majors, uh, uh, who has a background in this will be able to talk uh, about what the operation ramifications are uh, regarding those sites. Uh, so every time we move the fire station even a little bit, there's a ramification as to how we provide services to our township residents. Uh, so he's going to be able to address that. Uh, we will then delve into the design process, uh, which is essentially uh, what the proposed new fire station may look like and how we got to that point. Uh, and what input we use to, to figure out uh, what that ultimate design recommendation is going to be. Um, the next step, we're going to have to talk about a temporary operations plan. Uh, if the township does decide to uh, rebuild Fire Station 1 on the current site, uh, there's going to be the need for us to continue to operate on a different site during that construction period. Uh, so we'll be able to talk a little bit about uh, what that plan could be and what the operation ramifications might be. Uh, of course, on everybody's mind is going to be the financial considerations. Uh, I always will say, in my perspective, this is probably the single biggest capital improvement uh, project that the township 
uh, will have considered uh, in its uh, history, at least in its recent history. Um, and a lot of uh, work went into determining what the range of costs may be for the fire station as designed. I can talk a little bit about how those came up and, um, and how we may be looking at to pay for this project if it's ultimately approved by the township board. Um, next, we wanna take a little delve into some comparative station projects. So as part of this project, we looked not only in the state of Michigan, but outside of the state of Michigan as well uh, to understand what other communities were spending on projects of a similar scope. Uh, and Chief has some great information about that and he'll be able to share. Uh, and then of course, next steps. Uh, so really, this is still a step in the project design process. Uh, we need to get uh, feedback from our residents uh, as to uh, what they like, what they don't like, um, and that all that information will be provided to our township board members as we go through these final steps. Uh, and I'll delve into that a little bit more. Uh, and then, of course, why we're all here is for the public input. So uh, our intention is for this presentation to last approximately 45 minutes. Uh, that will give us 45 minutes to solicit input from uh, you guys, the public. As I mentioned, there's also going to be a survey that's going to be open to the public for uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a long period after this is closed. So we can make sure everybody that wants to comment on the presentation has an opportunity to do so. Uh, so we are planning on uh, this presentation ending at 730. Uh, so that gives us 45 minutes for the presentation and 45 minutes or so for public comment. And if the presentation runs a little bit long, uh, we will make sure that we adjust the ending time so that there's uh, time for everybody to, to comment. And our moderator, uh, Assistant Manager Fast, will talk about how to comment uh, once we get to that part in the presentation. So if we go to the next slide, please. So real just briefly, I wanna talk about the, the basis of the facility study, uh, the overall scope, uh, and then in a little bit later in the presentation, uh, Jim Horman will get into the actual uh, results of the study itself. But we, if we could go to the next slide, uh, this was, uh, in my opinion, the, the key graph that came out of the community engagement study that we did in 2018 and 2019, which showed uh, where we should prioritize our funding in terms of the township facilities. Uh, and there's, there's great information that's in that study. And if you're interested in reviewing again, it's available on our website, uh, but you can see in the red box uh, in terms of the responses that we got, an overwhelming majority of the residents identified fire station number one as a top priority uh, for the community. And as Jim addresses the study that was done, you're gonna see exactly why uh, that came out as a top priority. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk a little, a little about, about the township growth curve now. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you can see Cascade Township's population growth over the past couple of decades. Uh, so in, the 19, in 1970, the U.S. Census pegged the Cascade Township population at 5,243 people. Uh, and you can see that the, the growth begins exponentially after that. In 1980, we had 10,120 people. 1990, 12,896, 2000 up to 15,107, and 2010, uh, which is the last official census information we have, the population of the township is at 17,134 people. Now our population estimate for 2020, uh, when the census comes out, is gonna be right around 20,000 uh, residents. Uh, 19,406 actually comes from the 2019 census estimate. Uh, and then we delved a little bit into the West Michigan Regional Planning Commission's documentation. And based on the growth curve that the township has experienced over the past uh, six, five or six decades, uh, they're anticipating that our 2030 population uh, will be approaching 25,000 people. Now, of course, the township hasn't stood still during this entire time. Uh, and since we're talking specifically about the fire department tonight, that's what I'll talk about as well. Uh, but we've been making incremental improvements to the department all along as this population growth has uh, come along as well. And some of you that are longtime residents of the, the township will probably remember all these steps as well. So the current station that we're in uh, was purchased by the township in 1980. Uh, so it was not built to be either a township hall or a fire station. It was an existing building uh, that was purchased by the township and modified for those purposes. Uh, the previous location of the fire station was at 6865 Cascade Road, uh, and that is currently uh, a bridal shop. 
1983, uh, the department added its first full-time uh, maintenance lieutenant. Uh, and five years later in 1988, we added our first uh, full-time regular personnel, which included two full-time firefighters and a full-time inspector. Um, in 1990, uh, again, the growth, you know, you can see from 80 to 90, we had some significant growth. Uh, the department added two more full-time firefighters, and that was the beginning of our first full-time second shift. Um, and then in 1995, uh, we added six full-time firefighters, and that was the first year that we provided uh, full 24-hour coverage uh, for Cascade Township residents using full-time firefighting staff. Uh, in 1996, uh, the department completed the construction of station number two, uh, that's also known as Buttrick Station uh, to uh, some of our residents. Um, but at the time it was completed, it was only for paid on call response. So it was not staffed with full-time firefighters, uh, but as our paid on call firefighters responded to incidents, they were able to respond to station number two and take the apparatus from there. In 2005, our department added another six full-time firefighters to staff station number two. And in 19 or 2018, uh, our department added another three full-time staff to bring our full-time staffing to six people per day. Um, in 2019, another small incremental step, we added another full-time inspector uh, that we actually share with our building department as well. Uh, so that's just a little insight into the growth of our fire department as we've experienced population growth uh, over the past five and six decades. If we could go to the next slide, please. So now we're gonna delve a little bit into that study from 2018 and 2019 that I was talking about. And I'm gonna invite uh, Jim from Progressive AE to step up and talk a little bit about how the study was conducted and what was found and what the opportunities were that were identified for station number one. Uh, so I will turn it over to you, Jim. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, so the next slide, please. We're gonna start with a, a recap of, of some of the information that was shared back in 1819. Um, First is the facility assessment where we study the building and the property to find you know, where it's worn a little thin. Um, this is a good example. Ben mentioned the building had been used as a previous business. It was a insulation manufacturing facility and it was a pre-engineered metal building. And we've since turned that into the fire station. So with that plus additions, um, it, it's, it's created some site constraint issues uh, the first bullet is positioning behind the township hall uh, did possess a site safety concern that we had studied with pedestrians um, walking in the parking lots where the apparatus vehicles were also um, arriving and, and leaving. Second was a lack of visibility and separation at the entry of the station, which is at the back of the building and the risks that, that poses. Uh, additionally, the apparatus bays are small and they don't comply with the current requirements or standards um, for um, apparatus bay and equipment and, and firefighters. Uh, mechanical systems in the building are not operating adequately um, and they are aging and, and some of those um, have end of life uh, deficiencies. Uh, in, in addition to the interior space and circulation um, constraints because they're tight, they do pose um, some issues when firefighters are responding in a hurry to safely get to the vehicles to prepare for the emergency. So, so that is uh, one of the observations that we had uh, operationally in addition to some of the building deficiencies. The staff quarters are, are undersized um, and they don't provide for gender separation uh, as well as the uh, living quarters are undersized and they limit the firefighters ability to navigate um, safely uh, in several areas of the building in the event of an emergency. Next slide, please. So what this slide does is it, it, it is a recall of what the residents had given back through survey and through the public engagements of the past, which is uh, the, the really the observations, interviews and results um, allowed us to help recommend priorities. Uh, and number one, again, is the fire station. Uh, so that's what this slide is, is really recalling for all of us is, is how many people really saw the need of the station, the property, and the operations of firefighting uh, being raised to the first position for prioritization. Next slide, please. So getting back to uh, the needs of the 
the building itself um, for, for providing uh, per the National Fire Protection Association standards, the department has outgrown the facility and does not meet all the current building codes. Uh, a, a safe operation does not exist between visitor entry and the internal operations of the fire station. Vehicular and pedestrian traffic um, on the site do create conflicts that are not safe. The staff living quarters, as I mentioned, are undersized and don't allow for gender separation or adequate circulation during emergencies. The vehicle apparatus bays are too low for the trucks. I remember we were in there and, and the, some of the mirrors are even folded in for the trucks to, to exit and enter the building. And then and, and, uh, accommodating the equipment, there, there's always extra equipment that needs stored by our firefighters. Um, and that is, is a challenge in this facility as well as mechanical systems um, and the building envelope. Again, a pre-engineered metal building that has been added onto over the years um, is, is deficient in a number of ways, so it's not adequate. Next slide, please. In addition, and Chief can probably comment on this a lot more than I can because he's living it, um, certainly the pandemic has further uh, increased the awareness of the deficiencies um, of the station. So um, the tight quarters, uh, the CDC requirements, the limited showers and wash areas for decontamination, uh, you know, which, which often means they do wait um, for using them. Uh, washer and dryer for contaminated uniforms um, isn't there, the turnout gear or the bedding. So when those need to be cleaned, uh, that's not available. There's no sanitation or decontamination area for the medical equipment. Um, and the common bunk room uh, without the adequate space, again, for physical distancing, which we've all experienced in the pandemic, is, is a great concern for tight quarters. Um, and that in com combination with the gym and the TV room also are small space uh, that don't allow for physical distancing as well. Next slide, please. Hey, Jim, I'm just going to stop you for a minute. Uh, Chief, is there anything you want to add in on the uh, COVID-19 issues? Because uh, this is one that's obviously come to the forefront for us for uh, the past nine months. And uh, I don't want to leave with the impression that this is just in regards to COVID-19, uh, but really has exasperated issues that already, deficiencies that already existed in the facility. Yeah, so Jim touched on it uh, on it pretty well. A um, couple of things. Yeah, you know, it, it's not just COVID-19. It's, it's cold, flu, norovirus, meningitis, hepatitis, any of our contagious viruses have always been a struggle for us in this um, this tight of, of quarters. It's been exasperated and, and really highlighted during COVID because of that sense of urgency. Um, our fire crews run anywhere from two to four uh, COVID positive calls a day, and then they're required to reset after, a, after one of these to make sure that the next time we go into somebody else's home, uh, we don't take any of those um, viruses with us, but then also we can decontaminate our crews when they get back as well. Um, so some of these issues and in, in, in not having that available really kind of log jabs us when we're trying to reset quickly for that next emergency. And uh, it's, it's just been, it's, it's been a struggle this year um, with, with COVID having a little bit more uh, sense of urgency to deal with some of those. So it, it definitely came to the forefront, uh, forefront this year uh, for an already existing problem, for sure. Great, thank you, Chief. We'll turn it back over to you, Jim. All right, thank you. So on the next slide, uh, the station, you know, to Chief's point, needs a bit additional building area to provide for a safe environment, safe in operations and movement, safe with um, air quality and certainly COVID um, issues. Uh, there are a couple of things with uh, relocating uh, the township hall, um, certainly, uh, for the fire station to expand anyways, making use of the township property for emergency services is one of the really the bigger benefits. Um, the township already owns the property and we'll go into some location topics um, after this. Uh, although this is not on a major thoroughfare or on a major roadway, it is really close to 28th Street. So maybe that's a, a slight negative um, under A. B is identifying an alternate location for the station between I-96 and the Thorn Apple River. Uh, again, you know, reducing uh, coverage area from the current 
served population is a big consideration and one that we do not want to go down. And then uh, it can decrease visibility and access uh, depending on where it's located. So uh, there was quite a bit of, of uh, effort that went through the next part of this study. Next slide, please. Great, thanks, Jim. So uh, the next, uh, what we're, we're gonna get to next in our presentation is site selection process and operation ramifications. Uh, so this really gets into the, uh, we've kind of set the table with the background information. Uh, now we want to talk uh, more about how we uh, selected the recommended site for the fire station uh, and then what that means to our operations. So uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Chief Majors uh, so we can talk a little bit more about the process we went through for this. All right, thanks, Ben. Yeah, I'm going next slide, please. All right, so when we analyze uh, where is a good place to put a fire station, we look at a lot of different, a uh, lot of different items. And I'll kind of touch on some of those those highlights right now. Uh, again, Ben and I analyzed dozens uh, of properties in Cascade Township, and started off with just to simply, is is this is there potential to house a fire station? Is it big enough? Um, so that, that leads us into our first bullet point, uh, lot size. Ideally, a uh, fire station, especially a headquarters fire station should be about three acres or bigger. Um, location, you're looking so in station one's area is west of the Thornapple River. Um, need to have access to emergency response routes that are north, south, east, and west um, uh, applicable. Ideally, somewhere near 28th Street is that's our busy uh, thoroughfare and, and, and commercial district. And then your Kraft or Thornhills roads, which uh, provide your south routes. Um, so it's gotta be ideally, you know, three acres in size at least uh, west of the river. And then hopefully near the intersections of Thornhills and 28th or Kraft and 28th based on our data and our historical response volume. Uh, Another thing to look for, access to a traffic light, especially on 28th, 28th Street. Anybody who's driven 28th knows how busy traffic that can be from a safety standpoint. You've got to access a traffic light or be close to a traffic light to make entry onto 28th Street. Uh, visibility, do, do the residents know where the fire station is? That's important. Um, if, you, if you hide it or if it's in a location that's not um, on a main road, that can be difficult for residents to know where your fire station is or what services that uh, we provide. Another one is emergency flow. How long does it take you to get out of the area, the neighborhood? How, how long does it take you to get to 28th or Kraft or Thornhills or Cascade Road, Patterson, some of the, the highway, uh, some of those access points, uh, that's important too. And some of it's zoning, is it, uh, is it zoned appropriately for a fire station? There's certain areas that it just doesn't fit uh, what Cascade is, is planning for. Uh, speed of the road, is it a residential speed or is it uh, 55 miles an hour? That's, it makes a big difference and when you're trying to get to an emergency fast and safe. Uh, again, we talked about historical call volume and locations. We've mapped out every single call that we've had for the last 10 years, every year, year after year, and we can kind of pinpoint what next year is going to look like. And so when we put a fire station there, is that coverage going to encompass the majority of those calls statistically? Uh, so we do look at that. We look at NFPA 1710 coverage, which is basically the standard for the organization and deployment of fire suppression operations, emergency medical operations by career fire departments. Uh, that four minute standard that we try to adhere to uh, is important because that is proven that in an emergency for a medical that four minutes will save lives. And in a fire, that four minutes will put that fire out a lot faster. Uh, so there's that. There's mutual aid considerations. We have excellent neighbors that we not only respond to, but they respond into Cascade as well. I think we need to consider how long does it take them to get to those areas? What does that look like? How, where does our backup come from? Where do those layers uh, kind of shake out? So that's important to go over that. Uh, another thing is noise. Are we gonna put this next to, uh, in a neighborhood that uh, is adverse to a noisy fire station? Uh, is it next to an elementary school or a retirement home or a library or, or anything that might be averse to noise because fire stations are noisy. And last is safety. It is the site that we select conducive to safety, not only for our firefighters, but also to our residents or anybody visiting or traveling to or through. And so some of the, those are some of the considerations that, uh, that we set the table for criteria. So Ben and I sat down for months and analyzed dozens of properties. Fortunately, Cascade does for Cascade doesn't have a lot of properties available. It's uh, 
a, a lot of people want to be in Cascade. A lot of those three acre or, or bigger um, sites have thriving businesses on them. So it was a struggle to find uh, parcels that could meet all of those criteria. And it was even a struggle to find uh, parcels that could meet most of the criteria. So we were able to narrow it down to three uh, sites that meet all or most. And out of those, we were able to uh, drill down and identify that, that it was a possibility. And, uh, and when we analyzed further uh, from there. So looking at the map, you'll see that one of them was the Thornhills Avenue property that we are located at right now. That is where current station one is. If you look down, the next one is Charlotte Boy Drive and 28th, that intersection. Everybody knows the busy intersection, but there's a site there that we analyzed and uh, Charlotte Boy Drive and Orchard Vista property, uh, which is a little bit south of that. That is another uh, parcel that, that did make most of the criteria that we'll analyze here in a bit. So if we go next slide. All right, uh, proposed location number one. This would be the Charlotte Boy Drive and Orchard Vista site. Uh, there's pros and cons to this as well. Um, one of the, I guess the pros is it is available with plenty of acres. This one is actually for sale, which was a bonus. Um, it is very expensive, which is only down in the, uh, in the cons category, but it, it is for sale. It adds primary coverage to our more commercial and industrial areas. So it gets us a little bit farther west, which covers our hotel district, which, which oftentimes we respond to quite a bit. Uh, more of our commercial district towards, um, towards Patterson and some of our larger businesses like your Costco's or your Walmart's. Um, so some of those uh, would, would improve coverage to those areas, which tend to be hotspots uh, for us for calls. And another pro is you wouldn't need uh, temporary coverage during construction. So if we decided, if the public and the township board and the fire department decided that that was the best location, uh, you wouldn't have to, have to temporarily relocate fire department operations for that. So those are some pros with the uh, Charlotte Boy Drive and Orchard Vista site. Now there is quite a few cons and we'll go through some of those really quick. Uh, the first thing is, is high acquisition costs. This is a seven acre parcel in a nice area. It's in the multiple millions of dollars. Um, it's about, that, that, that's significant. Um, so there's that. Uh, delays to response time due to location on a boulevard with a residential speed limit. So Charlotte Boy Drive, Orchard Vista, pulling out from that lot, that is a boulevard 25 mile an hour residential speed road that would cause some significant delays or would have to get completely redone, which causes delays or, or uh, it can be expensive. Um, delays in response for support of station two area. So station two is basically covers anything east of the Thornapple River. Now Myosha requires a two and two out rule for us. So unless there's an active rescue in a fire, we can't enter your house in a in a fire until we have backup coverage. So until station one's crew gets there or mutual aid gets there, we can't enter and put your fire out, which causes delays. So this uh, this location, which is down in Charlotte Boy Drive in a residential area, it takes you know a good 30 seconds to a minute to just get to 28th Street, and then from there you have to get all the way east. So that is a uh, consideration as well. Uh, delays response and support to our area south of the airport. So if you look at the area south of the airport, that is growing rapidly. Um, we do have mutual aid uh, in place to help cover that area, but we still cannot meet any kind of 1710 response to that area. This would exasperate that because we cannot get, there's not a south route uh, from Charlevoix. You'd have to get to either Thornhills or Kraft. So that is an issue. Um, speaking of 1710, that's our four minute response that we try to adhere to. So if you'll notice on the map, that yellow blob for, for lack of better words, that's from that location, that is where we can get to in four minutes in an emergency. Um, again, it's, it looks like it, it, you know, decent coverage. Um, it, it does improve our, our, our service to the West, but then one of the cons, if you look, the, I guess, uh, Goodwood, Berger, Forest Valley, Cascade Rec Park area, that does, we do pull out of there that, that we do cover right now that that would not be covered. Uh, Manchester Hills, Montru and Beard neighborhoods, Laraway Lake, Tamaran, Thornapple River Drive and Windcrest. Those are critical neighborhoods with a lot of families. And so we would vacate our emergency four minute response to those. So we, we view that as a, as a big negative. Next slide. This next site is the, oh, too far. Next slide, this is the Charlevoix Drive and 28th Street. 
So one of the pros on this is it's got great visibility. Everybody knows exactly where that intersection is and you would drive by the fire station every day. That's a good thing. Uh, it does give us primary coverage to our more commercial districts and industrial areas, including our hotels. Uh, no need for temporary coverage during construction if we choose to go that route. So those are, those are some bonuses. It is closer on 28th. So you do gain a little bit of coverage to some of those critical neighborhoods, although not enough. Um, some of the cons, this parcel, is just two acres, which is very small and cramped. Uh, I think Ben and I, we still chose it as a potential possibility because the programming for what we need could still fit on there, although it would be very cramped and it would become an issue in the next 50 years. Uh, high acquisition costs. This parcel is not even for sale. We would, the township would have to acquire it and you can only guess, I guess, what that would look like as far as acquisition costs. Uh, creates traffic and accessibility issues to 28th Street. So that intersection is one of our busiest intersections in the entire township, if not the busiest. We do run a ton of traffic accidents there. Uh, I can imagine if you inject 2,000 calls for emergency service through there with a 30,000 pound fire engine, eventually you're gonna have problems. Um, so that is something to be cons uh, uh, considerate of. Again, delays in response and support for areas south of the airport. Again, there's, you're, not, you're kind of in the middle of Thornhills and Kraft, so you have to get to one of those two south routes to get south of the airport, which is important. Um, again, set NFPA 1710, we've got some critical neighborhoods like Manchester Hills, uh, Goodwood, Berger, Forest Valley, Rec Park, Tamarin, Thornapple, and Windcrest area. Those are critical neighborhoods as well that we would pull out of um, to gain access or, or to gain primary coverage to those industrial and commercial areas. All right, next slide. This is actually where we're at right now. Um, pros, where we're at, it is easy access to north, south, east, and west response routes because we are right on Thornhills just south of 28th. Um, it is an ideal three acre lot. Um, we live here and it, it is plenty big enough for what we're looking to do. And then this next one maximizes automatic aid from Kentwood Fire Department. So if you look on the map, it's the blue and purple blob is our four minute response from the Thornhill site. If you look at the pink and purple where it's shaded, that is where Kentwood Engine 52 or Station 2, that's how far they can get into our township with their four minute response. So their NFPA 1710 gets that far into or east into Cascade. And so we highlight this as an example of you're getting four minute coverage throughout both of those areas based on automatic aid agreements, which is, which is nice. So you do get a four minute response to your Costco's and your and your hotel areas as well as those critical neighborhoods from us as well so that that's a that's a big uh, big win right there um it is township owned uh, we already own it it is zoned for a fire station we do live here and people know where it's at that's a good thing um adequate coverage for both commercial and residential properties just touched on that so it still keeps those critical neighborhoods covered and then it also provides critical four minute response albeit from kentwood station two uh, as well as us backing up um, it is a suitable location to accommodate township growth. It is a good lot size. We can get south to cover uh, our growing area faster than the other two sites. And we can also uh, cover our station two and our, and our residents uh, east of the river and protect them uh, a little bit faster. Um, and then it eliminates relocation expenses. So if you don't have to acquire a multi-acre property somewhere, that is a cost uh, savings uh, to the township uh, to the township. Uh, some cons of where we're at right now, it does require that we demolish our existing station. I think some people thought that maybe we could remodel it, but if you look closely at our station, it is a it is a rusty metal building with a brick veneer. You can't, you just can't fix this anymore. Um, so it would have to be demolished, which means we would have to temporarily relocate fire department res emergency response operations to a temporary location, which, which can be a headache and we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, and then another con is it is, it does rely on mutual aid to cover uh, certain commercial and industrial areas. Uh, Kentwood is a very professional fire department. We do get some coverage from Ada to the north, uh, Lowell to, from the east, uh, Alto, Dutton, Caledonia. So we do have very good neighbors that respond to us uh, at the drop of a hat. So, but it does rely on some of that to in increase our coverage that way. Uh, next slide. And I think, Jim, I think we're going to kick this back to you. I believe this is uh, where you pick up again. Yep, 
Exactly. So what we did is we, we leveraged the insights, um, what Chief gave us for properties. Um, we can go to the next slide. And we also interviewed Chief and staff and, and we, we observed operations and we took that information along with, with um, fire station trends and best practices and created a program of what it would take along with our partners, what it would take to create a station that adequately supports the deficiencies they currently have, increases their operational um, efficiencies and safety. Um, and this graph and, and, and this graphic is a result of that where we have um, building spaces outlined along with the amount of square footage of building that's required to perform the function in those spaces. On the left, the graphic shows there, there is a public area to the station and then there is a, a more operational fire operations area. Um, and there's a line now between those. So the entry and the offices and the meeting space are traditionally more on the public side, but also used by chief and his staff. And then on the fire operations side, you certainly have the quarters for the firefighters, um, their personal rooms, and then the apparatus and equipment bay um, to house everything that needs to be stored. Uh, so this, this building area calculations uh, sheet really shows the public spaces as programmed, um, requiring about 2,400 plus square feet. Uh, the fire administration area um, for current staff uh, is sitting at around 2,059 square feet. Uh, the fire suppression operations at 581. Um, and then there are staff commons areas uh, as well that, that are around 4,038 square feet. Uh, this is programming. So now we're jumping to uh, line five, which is the apparatus bay. Um, 6,331 square feet uh, is programmed for the apparatus bay to hold all of the vehicles and their equipment and their turnout gear and everything that they need to, to respond in an emergency. Uh, maintenance and support areas, again, a minor amount of 360 square feet, but, but important to take care of a new facility, um, as is the building support area of 480 square feet. So Really, when you look at the totals of 16,284 programmed area that's usable, uh, there's a grossing factor that's applied to that, uh, really that picks up spaces that, that don't directly um, function as usable space. So it's circulation, it, it's structure, shafts and plenums, anything that, that could be used to support building systems. So as we gross that, that number up, by 1,628 square feet. We have a total main building area. The footprint of the building is programmed at 17,912 square feet. Uh, we are considering a, a mezzanine that's for circulation. Um, so that square footage would be in addition to that, taking it up to 19,000. But the base building footprint uh, is at 17,912 programmed square feet um, currently. So some of the areas under here, you can see the condition storage um, needs to be determined to separate from the main building. Uh, we have lawn equipment, we have event materials, generator, uh, training materials, seasonal storage for salt, uh, reserve brush truck and uh, boat storage that's seasonal, SUVs, plow trucks, um, and extra hoses. So there, there's quite a bit of storage that's needed both on-site and off-site um, as a result of this programming exercise. So we can go to the next slide. And Chief, feel free to throw anything in here if there's uh, anything of importance that I'm leaving out. This is a conceptual layout of that program. Um, what you'll see is that the entry is green and on the upper right hand side. So when you're, you're just conceptually laying out the, the plan of this, the entry where the public would come into the building um, is complemented on the right of that entry by the offices for chief and staff. Uh, beyond that uh, lighter green area is a meeting space for training. Uh, if we bring in tour groups for students and we want to hold them someplace for some education, this is a really good landing spot um, on the clean and on the safe side of the building is how I'd phrase it. Um, beyond that line of green is a door that leads to the quarters um, which is considered a, a cold zone uh, for the chief. It's not that it's temperature cold, um, the chief will get into that. Uh, but we do have in between there a transition zone, a warm zone 
uh, for uh, showers and restrooms. Um, and then the, the, the magenta or the purple color is the apparatus bay and equipment, which is considered a hot zone. So I think that's a, that's a, a layout, um, a conceptual plan that represents the 17,000 plus square feet. Um, and what we've done next is if you go to the next slide, We've taken the Thornhill Jim, site. If you could, yeah. Jim, if you could stop for just a moment, I'd like to give uh, Chief an opportunity to uh, comment on anything that he might have on the conceptual plan as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, just a uh, couple things I guess I could touch on. So people might be wondering, like, what, what are you talking about with hot zone, cold zone, warm zone? Now, NFPA uh, 1500, which is standard on fire department occupational safety, health, and wellness programs, specifically Chapter 10, which deals with fire facilities, is a requirement that you provide a hot zone zone, warm zone, cold zone, what that is. And so if, if our fire crews come back from a fire and they're contaminated with carcinogens or they come back from a medical and they've got some viral contagions on them, they come into that kind of purple area that's their apparatus base. So they're required to, that's where everything that is dirty and needs to be reset. So there, if you'll notice there's decon laundry in there, there's, there's, there's areas for them to reset the equipment uh, appropriately per NFPA standards. And then if you'll notice the warm zone, which is it's basically, it's got a staging area and it's got showers and wash facilities where we can reset and decontaminate our personnel and, and their uniforms. And then, so when they do go back to their sleeping quarters or their uh, TV room kitchen, uh, back to the offices, back where people are going to um, basically occupy that space, there, there's no contaminations or viruses or anything like that. So that's, those are requirements. Um, per NFPA standards and also too, that's that's kind of that transition area so people might understand what hot zone, warm zone and cold zone is. So that's specifically what that is. Um, and then just another thing too, I, I think that uh, the, the public has asked, you know, how is it laid out this way or what? We worked with Progressive A&E as a, as a fire department. So our personnel sat down with Progressive and Redstone Architects and, and designed kind of that flow. So this is coming from uh, firefighters that have to respond to these calls and live in the station and, and do the training and, and have their offices there and, and work out there and, and pull rigs in and out. So, so it was, it was a, a year long process where a comprehensive uh, input was, uh, it was designed by our folks as well as uh, professional architects. So that, that, uh, that was nice that they were able to kind of work with us uh, on this concept. Um, so from my end, that's all I have. Appreciate it. You know, firefighters and chief did a great job of giving input so that it laid out um, functionally, efficiently, and operationally to serve what the emergency needs are. So this is that resulting plan. So yeah, I do appreciate that, chief. Um, as we went through that process and what we learned um, from chief and staff, uh, the next slide shows that we have a site that is the Thornhill site. Um, so what we did is we, we applied um, the, the concepts of operation efficiency and safety to this property. Um, one of the first things that we said was uh, that the existing fire station um, located on this parcel is something that we own. Uh, so there's a, a positive to that. Um, we have looked at orientation of the station so that it's not behind Township Hall anymore. It's directly facing Thorn Hills Avenue for, for awareness for um, ease of egress out of the building to very quickly respond to a call for safety and separation like we talked about. Um, so this parcel, and every, a lot of you have been to this, you know that it is close to 28th Street, a quick left turn gets you to the light, which is also a positive. Um, that light can help with, with getting through it for the trucks. Um, the parcel is large enough as Chief, Chief has said uh, to support. Land use, again, is currently a station, so that's complementary. Um, and the parcel doesn't have any unique requirements or restrictions that we'd have to jump through hoops to make this work here. It's, it's a good site. Um, so that was one of the considerations. Um, it, it also is large enough to not only support the station, but the parking, the turning radiuses that these big trucks have um, with navigating, as well as a bypass lane. So. Um, that is that is important uh, so that there's some some pieces to uh, visiting equipment, visiting uh, trucks that may be uh, brought over to the station um, and, and be able to bypass the building and not be in the way of the station uh, doors themselves. 
Um, the quick access that Chief mentioned for north, south, east, and west and to the highway is obviously what we we have with this site today. You just can do it faster because you're likely going to go straight onto Thornhills um, and not making turns to get out of the property. Um, and then the the 20th Street light that we mentioned. The uh, Some of the cons may be the existing radio antenna on the uh, northwest corner of the property um, counts as a, a supporting a structure, so it doesn't allow us to put a support storage building on the property. So we listed that as a con. Um, along the south edge, there, there is a certain amount of topography change, so a grade drop. Um, we listed it as a con, but um, it's relatively straightforward with how to deal with it. So, um, but, you know, as opposed to a flat site, it's something that, that we know what to do with. And then, uh, again, Chief mentioned if, if this station uh, comes down that they're operating out of today, there is a temporary operations um, location needed during construction. Um, so that's one of the cons. But you can see the, the, graph, the graphic is illustrating the in and out arrows, the upper arrow on the upper right side of the graphic uh, is uh, a smaller access point that is shared by the adjacent plaza um, to the north of the property. And then a larger arrow on Thornhills where the apparatus would, would come out of the station. So we sort of assess that the, the trucks returning were coming in slower, controlled, and could come in through the north side of the, of the property, uh, come around um, to the rear of the building, and then pull straight into the apparatus bay um, so they could be prepared, uh, cleaned and prepared, brought into the building and ready for the next run when it's needed. Uh, we also have some some bubbles that show where public might park on the upper right corner as well if they came in through that smaller entry um, and on the back where staff parking might be located. Uh, so those were those were some of the the analysis that were used on the property itself. The next uh, slide shows uh, a more detailed conceptual layout of the property illustrating what I was talking about and you'll see in here that the fire station is white on the lower piece of that white box that sticks down to the south is the apparatus bay. We've drawn in uh, the trucks and the truck turning radiuses to show that, to illustrate that those radiuses work well to maneuver big vehicles around the building and into the apparatus bay. We've also outlined more with parking stripes where the public could park in the upper right, as well as in the back where staff parking could be held. Um, so there's the upper left radio tower um, is existing along with a building that supports it. We've done everything to conceptually locate a trash enclosure um, where we would have uh, more vegetation as a buffer to the surrounding properties. Uh, so as well as a bypass lane to the south of the building. Uh, and then of course on the right side off of Thornhills is the larger curb cut that allows the trucks to leave the building and turn left or right uh, when they're responding to an emergency. The uh, next slide, please. This is a, a, a 3D graphic that illustrates uh, a massing of the building so that we could get a sense for how large it would be. Again, one of the benefits of this building is, is its presence. You can, you'll be able to see the fire station now. Currently, you cannot see the station that well at all. Um, in addition to seeing the station, the doors for the apparatus would be glass. So. Uh, there's a lot of residents who like to go there for uh, at Halloween is a good example when people would come to the building and those doors, whether they're open or they're closed, it's visible inside and, and, and our trucks are something that we're pretty proud of. So it's kind of nice to see those. So this is that uh, 3D graphic illustration uh, just to show how large the, the building would be on the property. Next slide, please. All right, so as has been mentioned a couple times, if the decision is made to rebuild station number one on the current uh, station number one site, uh, there's gonna be a need to have a temporary operations plan because uh, we will not be able to operate out of the current station while that is going on. Uh, part of that can happen out of station two, uh, but we cannot have our only response area be out of station two. So uh, we're gonna turn it back over to Chief Majors uh, to talk about the opportunities that were identified for a temporary station during construction. All right, so really similar to earlier when we decide where a fire station should go if you're gonna build, similar considerations for a temporary operations uh, plan or station. 
Uh, one of the things that they consider is, is Cascade Township doesn't have a lot of existing facilities uh, that are available for rent that fit a fire apparatus. So we can go next slide, we can kind of walk through how we got there. All right, so we did find, we, we analyzed, I think, 18 different uh, possible buildings. And, and, and some of those, to be honest with you, we just started off with what has a 14 foot tall by 12 foot door that will fit a fire apparatus. Uh, that was that was uh, condition number one. You don't want to have in Michigan. You don't want to have um, fire engines full of water uh, sitting out for a month in, in February. Not only from a safety standpoint, uh, but from it, it'll it'll freeze. And so, so that was uh, criteria number one: is will it fit? It needs to be on the west side of the river in Station One's location. Uh, hopefully. Uh, closer to our areas that are historical call volumes, so you can kind of get to those areas at a 1710 uh, capacity faster. And so what we did is we analyzed a bunch, we whittled it down, and we came to one that was heads and tails above any other temporary facility uh, that was out there. And a lot of this was vetted out through our command staff and, and officers meetings and using those criteria from a response standpoint and, and, and what we can use. We found a facility that is available to rent on air cargo, which is uh, located at, uh, I guess, the very east end of the airport. Uh, this particular suite is owned by the airport and they're very accommodating and willing to work with us um, and, and to make that transition very smooth. So some of the pros of this uh, facility is it is, it's empty. It's readily available to rent in station one's response area. It can house one fire engine, one medic vehicle, four firefighters, one fire chief, and one fire inspector. So a good chunk of our operations at station one can be housed in a safe, warm, and dry environment. Um, we would be able to rent this for about 12 to 18 months, depending on construction. Uh, talking with, with progressive and, and, and kind of industry standards, that's about our estimate for how long we would be kind of put out of our, our current house and, and need to operate out of this facility. Um, Again, best option of the numerous site study by far. Uh, some cons, it does shift our coverage uh, 60 to 90 seconds south. Um, so in the southern end of the township, they're getting, a, they're getting a pretty good response rate. You can see that blue blob in this, in this map reflects the four minute response where that pink star is. That pink star is indicative of where that uh, rental facility would be. The blue represents how far you can get in that NFPA 1710 four minute response. So we're gaining some really good ground to the south. You see the green uh, blob is indicative of Kent Woods automatic aid from station two. The pink blob with the purple overlap is where station two's four minute coverage is. So it really does create a nice uh, puzzle there with uh, framed by the river. Uh, the only problem that we see is it does vacate quite a bit of our section to the north. And one way we can soften that is we can post a medic or an engine crew periodically throughout the day, uh, closer to that 28th street window so we can cover to the north. And that uh, is based on, we analyze all 2000 of our calls every year, when they happen, what time of year, what time of day, what are the circumstances? And so we can paint a pretty good picture of when those emergency calls will happen and where, and we can post a fire crew and, and try and hedge our bets and, and, and really put a, a crew in a position to, uh, to affect and mitigate an emergency. So we can soften that a little bit uh, depending on where we post uh, crew. But that is the uh, temporary operations as far as where we're gonna put uh, station one operations. And so we'll go to the next slide and, and keep going. So outbuilding interim and long-term use. So in addition to this, uh, fire station, a need we identified a couple years ago when we go through these facility studies is we do not have enough appropriate storage for the fire department. Um, station two and station one, we have quite a bit of equipment that we need to house that uh, right now is in the way or clutters up uh, apparatus bay and, and, and kind of prohibits getting these apparatus out to an emergency. Some of our staff cars and some of our equipment sit outside. Uh, which is not uh, which is not what we want to have. It, it's it needs to be inside and warm. Another thing that we cannot do right now is we do not have a reserve apparatus. Um, so anytime one of our fire engines goes down for service, which in any fire department happens at least once or twice a month, where you lose an apparatus to go get preventative maintenance or reactive maintenance based on if something went wrong, uh, and it's usually down for a day or two. So we we manage and we were able to 
uh, use a paid on call engine or a, a rescue or a medic or, or something that, to take that vehicle's place until we can get that back in service. We don't have a we don't have any place to put a reserve apparatus. And so we lose ISO points for that as well as a community. And I think in the future, specifically when we replace our next engine around the 2024 uh, timeframe, we will be able to keep our oldest apparatus as a reserve apparatus, which is safer for the public uh, responding to emergencies. If one of our engines goes down, it'll need to be stored in a in a basically a storage, a storage building that uh, we've identified here at station two. So station two is a large seven, eight acre property in the red right there in the back east corner of the parking lot is where that um, outbuilding would go. So next slide. So if you look at the two graphics, the one on the right is kind of what we had in mind uh, long term. This is why this uh, building needs to be built. It, it would house a reserve engine. There is a large generator trailer that we don't have room for or space for right now that needs a home. Uh, we've got a couple of SUVs, uh, mine included, uh, during the day or, or, or staff vehicles that do not have a place uh, that is undercover with heat uh, and locked up at night. We have a plow truck uh, with, a, with a spreader that needs a place to go. Um, we've got quite a bit of lawn equipment and equipment used to maintain not only the uh, grounds of the fire stations, but the, the facility themselves. We don't have a place to put those. And then storage, we have event storage. So we, we're very proud of 4th of July celebration. A ton of equipment and uh, material goes into that event. We don't have a place to store it. Um, Halloween, all these events that we, we love to support, they have to go somewhere. Uh, and so it's appropriate that we build uh, a storage facility that can house that. Um, on the left graphic, in the interim, if we choose to build on the Thornhill site, we can utilize that space to transfer our paid on call operations to station two, and then also house the two engines that will not fit at the temporary site uh, where they can be heated, locked up, secured, warm and dry as well. And so in a temporary capacity, the graphic on the left would, it would show where we're gonna put those apparatus that don't fit in the temporary facility and have our uh, paid on call respond out of station two and then the station two outbuilding. And then in the future, you'll show the graphic at the right. So it really fits nicely with uh, what we want to do in the future. Um, so that's what I have for that. Yeah, next yeah, slide. Yeah, we, we assess the, the property to support this use as well as the circulation of the traffic that goes around the current station to get to this. And it, it fits really well. And we were programming for this. There are other um, pieces of equipment that go in here. And I, I, I want to say thanks to not only the team, but uh, uh, Dan Redstone and Tefra Kowalski who helped with the programming and planning. So that's sort of how we flushed out the need for the storage facility for during construction operations and storage of vehicles uh, and then the long-term use, uh, which is the, the plan on the right. So next slide. Great. So thank you, Chief and uh, Jim, for going over the programming. Uh, of course, now we need to get, understand uh, what all of this is, is going to cost. Uh, and that's obviously a big part of the decision making process that the Township Board will need to consider. Uh, so we're going to get into the financial considerations for the project as presented. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Jim talking a little bit about the project estimate that they have developed uh, and what the different lines mean, because you're going to see a bunch of numbers come up at you. Uh, so he's going to explain a little bit more in detail why those are uh, separated out and what they mean. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the township board's decision making process uh, as to uh, how they then pay for those costs. Um, and then uh, after that, we'll allow Chief to get into uh, a little bit about some comparative projects in the state of Michigan uh, and the U.S. in general and how they compare to what we are doing. Now, I also want to say that I recognize that we're already 15 minutes over uh, the time that I talked about at the beginning, uh, but I think this is great information uh, that everybody needs to be shared with. So uh, our anticipation is that we will extend the public comment section as long as needed so that everybody that uh, wants an opportunity to uh, comment on the presentation has the opportunity to do so. So with that, we're gonna go to the next slide and I'll turn it back over to Jim to talk about the opinion of probable cost for the uh, fire station. Yeah, so the, the, pro, the, the program is complete as well as the conceptual layout, but the, the fire station itself is not designed. So we have this as an opinion of probable cost. And the way we organize this is we have a low and a high range on the right side. Those two columns give a low and a high. 
um, because the building size, the type of construction, its use, uh, current cost uh, trends uh, for materials and labor are all considered when doing an opinion of probable cost. So the first line or the first row is the construction cost of the building itself. So based on the square footage of uh, the footprint of the building, 17,912 square feet, we have a low range of $3,096,900 and then the high range of $3,558,800. Um, right below that is the site development costs or the property to develop that. And we have that as a 668 to 7700, $773,000 uh, dollar range uh, right now. So that is the building and the site cost. Down below that are general conditions, everything that it takes to build the building from the superintendent and the project manager to the fencing and the porta johns, everything that it takes to really put the, those, the materials in place is the general conditions, 339,500 up to $393,000. And then the general requirements uh, for contractor fees, bonds, uh, insurance, anything that is used on the administrative side is six, 316000 to four hundred or 366500 dollars So the construction cost of the project, uh, the opinion of probable cost is, is $4.4 million to $5.119 million. Uh, you can see right below that is the construction cost per square foot broken out. So if you if you do the math on that, it's $262 to $304 as a low to high range per square foot uh, for the station construction cost and the site. Uh, right below that, we have design contingency and construction contingency. Uh, this is money that is not spent. It is money that's earmarked in case it's needed uh, as the project goes through the design phases and through the construction phases. Uh, this is that, that money that is earmarked to pick up anything that's needed during construction and uh, design and construction. And then an escalation line is really in there in case uh, the project goes beyond a year. Um, and then there's an increase in the cost of the project uh, from one year to the next. So timing matters for when this project goes. So that line is to cover that. So the potential construction cost with contingency is sitting at 5.261 million uh, up on low range to 6.091 million on the high range. Um, so that is uh, coupled with the percentages below of 15 on the low and 20 on the high of soft costs that are anything that the township needs to cover furniture, uh, AE fees, reimbursable expenses, uh, especially equipment, wayfinding. So when you apply those percentages of the owner cost to the construction value, um, it puts a low range number for the, for the project cost at $6,050,380 uh, to the high range of $7,310,280. Um, so that is the low to high range opinion of probable cost for this project. Great, so thanks for getting into that, Jim. Just to talk a little bit about then, obviously that is a big number as I kicked off the meeting, uh, is anticipated that really no matter what the scope of the project ends up being, uh, this will probably be the single largest capital improvement project the township's ever taking on. Uh, so the township board would still have to make the decision, okay, if we're gonna go forward with this project, how do we pay for this? And there's a couple of different options for them to consider. Um, as the township board has talked about in our previous audits, uh, in pre previous budgets and capital improvement plans and meetings with the community. Uh, they have been saving for these projects for a while now. Uh, the uh, recent uh, acquisition of a building and renovation for uh, a new township hall was completely paid for out of general fund reserves that were saved both in the, the township uh, general fund and the building department fund. Uh, and the township has significant fund balances to cover um, what I'll say is probably a portion of this project as well. Um, uh, the audit for 2020 obviously isn't completed yet, uh, but it's anticipated that when the audit is complete, uh, the general fund fund balance at the end of uh, fiscal year 2020 is going to be in that uh, six and a half to seven and a half million dollar range. So again, funds that have been saved specifically for this. Uh, and the fire fund has uh, a fund balance too, uh, somewhere between two and 2.5 million dollars uh, when things are all said and done with the um, 
with the audit. So the township board is going to decide what level of that fund balance they're comfortable with using towards this project. Uh, and then, of course, you have to figure out where the rest of the funds uh, will come from as well. Uh, the township board's committed uh, all along that uh, they, they don't anticipate having to raise taxes for uh, this project, uh, even if they chose to uh, use bond financing, uh, they would use the current revenues that the township collects, uh, both in their general fund and potentially in their fire fund uh, to help pay the debt service uh, for that. Um, so there is some homework that still needs to be done on that end. Uh, they'll need to take a hard look at uh, these financial numbers and figure out where exactly that money is going to, to come from. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. Again, uh, our, a big part of our project was, okay, we, we went through this whole process. Uh, we looked at the sites that were available. We looked at the needs of the department. Uh, we developed uh, what we think is a project that fits those needs uh, and uh, meets the priorities of the communities. Uh, what are other communities doing? Uh, we like to benchmark ourselves uh, to make sure that we're at least in the same ballpark. I think there's an understanding of everybody that was involved in this project that each community is going to have its own nuances. Uh, there's going to be differences about how they complete things. Um, but we wanted to know, hey, are we in the general ballpark? So uh, we tasked Chief with uh, taking a look at uh, what was going on in some other communities in Michigan uh, and then going on kind of in the state in general. So if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Majors to talk about some of these projects. Yeah, so when we when we look at comparative projects, I think it's important that we look at what type of fire station we're building, because not all fire stations are created equal. And so you've got everything from a volunteer station in a rural community to a satellite station, which is a, a station that just needs to house a fire engine and a fire crew. You've got combination departments, you've got combination satellite stations, headquarters fire stations, all of the above. Cascade Township is a combination department that needs a headquarters fire station. And so what that means is in a headquarters fire station, you need an office for a fire chief, you need an office for a fire marshal, a fire inspector, you need a training room, you need all of those things, admin support to, which makes a little bit bigger fire station. We have career full time and then we also have paid on call. And so all of those challenges together create a combination headquarters fire station. So we went and looked and found anything built in the last couple of years or is going to potentially be built in the next year or two that is a headquarters combination fire station that is similar to what we have. And what we came up with was Portage Fire Department of Portage, Michigan. They're a very similar community to ours. Their fire department is very similar to ours. They just built an 18,000 square foot, $6.1 million dollar combination headquarters station. It's a beautiful fire station. A lot of our ideas were modeled after that. That is an excellent station that, that will serve their community for the next 50 years. That is a benchmark that uh, I think we're right on par with. Um, Monroe Fire, a 15,560 square foot combination headquarters station at $6.4 million built in 2019. Very similar to what we're looking to build. Highland Fire, 14,000 square feet, 5.6 to 7.6 on target for 21. Dexter Fire is proposing a 31,000 square foot station because they've got quite a bit um, extra uh, space they need for their apparatus, et cetera, and that's at the seven plus range. Hopefully that they will get uh, this year. So those are some local uh, Michigan fire departments that that fall in line with what we're looking to what we're looking to do in our vision and in our footprint. But then also too, I think it's important that we look in North America. So we reference the Firehouse Magazine Station Design Study where they analyze every single fire station built in North America in 2020. There was 58 newly constructed fire stations in North America this year. Average size, 16,728 square feet. Average cost, $6.628 million. So we are exactly where we need to be. We're not overshooting, we're not undershooting. We're, we're right on target. And that's so why I think uh, Progressive A&E, Redstone, the township, the fire department, I think we did a pretty good job of encapsulating what we need with a little bit of room to grow and, and a sufficient fire station uh, for us and all our program needs. So th these are some comparatives to, to rest assured that we are exactly on target for, for what's, what's appropriate for Cascade Township. Great, Chief. I, I appreciate you going over that. And uh, we can go to the next slide. 
All right, so we are we are getting near the end, and we're about ready to take our comment from the the community. Again, I appreciate everybody who's been able to stick around for this presentation to hear about the uh, proposal that's being put together, uh, and we're eager to hear from you. Uh, I just want to let you guys know kind of where we are at the next step. So again, this this plan is in is in the draft phase. Uh, really, the township board as a whole really hasn't had an opportunity to uh, to delve deeply into this project uh, as we've still been designing it. Uh, though I will mention that the township board members are in the audience tonight and are certainly eager to hear what the public has to say as well. Uh, so when the presentation is done, we're gonna open up the public comment period. Uh, again, this uh, meeting is being recorded and every comment that we receive from the public is gonna end up as an appendix in the final study. Uh, so we wanna make sure that everybody's looking at anybody that's looking at the study understands uh, what the public had to say about it as well. Uh, so not only will we take public comment from this, uh, we will turn around, we will put this presentation up on our website uh, along with a, uh, a brief uh, survey monkey survey, uh, which is pretty open-ended, give anybody an opportunity to uh, log in, uh, listen to the presentation and make any comments that they may have. Uh, we're gonna have that uh, comment period open for about three weeks um, and our communications team will be working uh, with local media and through our social media pages to make sure that everybody understands uh, that that presentation is up there to review and that uh, there's an opportunity to make public comment as well. Uh, so once we have that public comment, we're going to assemble the final report uh, and then we're going to start talking to our township board members about uh, about the, the, the project and we have some committee structures that we go through uh, to take comment on that. Uh, we have a public safety advisory committee. Uh, that'll look like at the station itself. Uh, and then we have a finance and personnel committee uh, that will look like look at the funding for that as well. And they will help us as staff identify, okay, are there changes that we need to make to this initial uh, design uh, to uh, reach their goals uh, in what they would like to accomplish uh, with this capital improvement project? Uh, and then help us establish, okay, what is gonna be the uh, final funding mix for this? How are we gonna pay for this project that, it, that so it goes forward? Uh, once we have that input from the public and we have that input from our committees as well, it'll culminate in a presentation to the township board. Again, in a public setting, uh, we'll get back up. You're gonna hear a lot of this same information, uh, but this presentation will be made to the township board instead of, instead of to the public uh, with opportunities for uh, people to continue to comment, uh, to understand uh, the changes that might've been made uh, from this process and what that is. Uh, and then really it will be up to the township board of that, that point to decide what that next step is going to be. Uh, again, all we have is a, is a conceptual idea right now, uh, a probable estimation of costs. Uh, if the township board did want to move forward, that next step obviously would be to bid the project. Uh, and we would work on uh, construction drawings. They would have to authorize next step of the engineering study to work on construction drawings, uh, to get uh, some bids back from uh, construction companies to understand, okay, uh, what is that really going to, what, what is the real cost of the project? You know, are those contingencies important? Are those contingencies not important? Uh, are we looking at a price in that high end? Are we looking at a price in that low end? Really give them an idea, okay, uh, we're going to go from this range to what the cost of the project is going to be. And then again, another opportunity to uh, take a look at, at that, uh, an opportunity to make changes if those changes are needed. Um, ultimately, it would culminate in the township board having to accept a bid in order to actually move the process forward. So still a long way to go in the process, but we're nearing the uh, light at the end of the tunnel um, and looking forward to uh, taking some public comment. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn it over to our assistant township manager, uh, Stephanie Fast, uh, and she is going to let you know uh, how you can uh, provide us uh, comment uh, for the presentation and the project that was shown tonight. Thank you so much, Manager Swayze. I appreciate everyone's patience. I know we received some questions um, while the presentation was going forward. I encourage everyone that asked those questions to please um, ask them again during the public comment period. As the woman behind the curtain, I do not know uh, the answer to those questions, so we will need to pose them. Um, if you do not feel comfortable posing them publicly, I will make sure that they get answered and are shared with our survey results. Um, anyone who would like to make a public comment may use the raised hand feature 
and I will let you know when it's your turn and unmute your microphone. If anyone is joining us via telephone, please press star nine and I will go through the same process with you. We do ask that you try to keep your question or comment to about three minutes, just to make sure that I'll, everyone that's joining us is able to share their thoughts. And Hunter, you can go ahead and stop the slideshow if you'd like. Okay. Our first comment comes from Zoom Room Thornapple. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I apologize. This is Andrew Vanover, uh, Cascade resident, <clears throat> signing in on my work account. Curious to know, thanks for the presentation, um, for making this available. How are the construction costs estimated? If you can scroll back to that slide, I'd like to know if that was done just by Progressive A&E or if a construction company was, was involved. Great, thank you for that question. And I'm gonna ask uh, Jim to start with a response for that one. Sure, so that this was uh, put together without contractors. This was Progressive AE and Redstone Architects um, pulling past project history for fire stations, as well as current costs uh, in the marketplace, uh, and including the uh, escalation uh, opinions and contingencies. So strictly done in-house by the uh, architects and engineers. Jim, could you talk a little bit more about the partnership with Redstone? I think that was a key partnership in this process. Uh, a fire department can be a very um, specific type of construction. Uh, and we brought Redstone in specifically to uh, lend that fire station experience to uh, the study and talk a little bit more about how they, they might've been able to help develop those costs. Yeah, d definitely mentioned Dan earlier, Dan Redstone, they, they're a wonderful partner. Uh, really experts at public safety. Uh, so we were able to bring those that group in early to be part of the team um, where they bring all of their fire station uh, and response uh, experience uh, as well as costs from previous stations that were built. Um, they can use anything from, uh, well, any range of station, uh, but like I mentioned, it's, it's about the size, the type of construction and scale of the project. Uh, and then the site itself. So they have, uh, we have square foot averages that we can use uh, balanced against previous project experience and historic cost for stations. Uh, any stations that are older than a year, uh, those numbers are then uh, right sized for today's cost as well. Sure thing, and then can I ask a follow up? Certainly. So, I, and, and I know having done this um, commercial construction with, with our church in the past, that uh, you start with this sort of a, a program and with the architects and then you get your construction company on board and I assume we'd follow the standard schematic design and construction be report backs to the public in those phases as we watch how the costs become more refined over time and would would public have input or would board have control um, I know you guys have done your best and that's all any of us can do. I also know there can be variation as the process goes along. So how would that be managed by the board and or township? Yeah, yep. So great question again, and I appreciate it. I'm going to take a stab at that one. Uh, so the, the short answer is yes. Uh, the township board actually cannot do anything uh, that's not in the public eye. So uh, at a minimum, all of this information would be discussed at a, a public meeting. Uh, but we've really tried to take, uh, you know, through these, this facility study uh, into the, the fire station concept, uh, you know, a, a robust approach to um, keeping the, the public informed about the process as well. So really the first step is going to be for the board to decide uh, based on the, 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 the presentation and the report and the, the public feedback that we got is that is this a range that they are comfortable with? Um, and if it's not a range, if it's a range that they're not comfortable with, then uh, there's no use going out and getting those bids in the first place. Um, so there's an opportunity for us to uh, to take a look at maybe is there a potential for a redesign uh, or not. Um, if it is something that they're comfortable with, uh, then we would go to, to those next steps. We would get those bids back. And again, there's another opportunity for us to share that information with the public, to share that information with the board. Uh, you know, it may be that, yep, they're comfortable with the range, but they want to see low end and are worried about it coming uh, uh, in over the high end. We all know the construction materials, uh, the price of those has swung wildly during the uh, uh, 
uh, COVID-9 pandemic. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for public input uh, while the board is considering uh, as these cost estimations get narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. Great, Steph, okay. could you bring the, the next person in, please? Yes, sir. Our next commenter are Matt and Lisa Grozer. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes sir. we can hear you. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you so much for all the uh, good information on this presentation. It's uh, It's been a process to watch, um, you know, the last couple years of activity on this. And I just want to express uh, our appreciation uh, as taxpayers for the work that you folks have put into this. Um, this is good information for us to have. In terms of uh, expandability, um, you know, growth of the township uh, usually relates to uh, growth in services. And the uh, fire department, you know, in the current building has been there now 40 years, uh, probably uh, longer than we anticipated early on, uh, you know, back in the 70s and early 80s as they were acquiring the current facility. What opportunities for growth are there with this current design? So in other words, are there parts of this building uh, where without too much work, an extra apparatus bay could be added if needed down the road? Or um, you know, is the direction really to look at that Southwest quadrant and a new facility uh, like a station three facility uh, down south of the airport to accommodate for whatever apparatus um, you know, needs that we have that may exceed this uh, headquarter facility uh, and what we can park there? Yeah, great question, Matt. I really appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Majors to start that conversation. Yeah, no, good question. Um, so twofold, the, the station concept that we designed does have uh, some of that 50 year anticipation built into it, uh, meaning that there is another office that isn't earmarked for anybody that could potentially be used for a deputy chief or a future lieutenant uh, someday. There is room in the apparatus base for additional rigs. Uh, we did we did factor that in that uh, potentially more rigs or could be used for that. There is also an extra bunk room for paid on call that would be training and observing, but then also too, if, if the crew did grow by another three full timers divided by three, uh, three different shifts that it could accommodate that. So it, it, it is built with growth in mind. I guess one thing is we potentially increase uh, our personnel footprint. Um, most of that would be towards the, I guess would you say maybe a future station three Southwest of the airport. That would be what we would call like a satellite station, some sort of emergency service uh, satellite station, which would be a smaller station that wouldn't need a lot of the administrative support, but it would have that apparatus bay with a crew that could respond there. And then station two right now only has two firefighters and it's a, it's a, it's a, a good size fire station that could accommodate a third firefighter um, in the future. So we are positioned very well uh, with this concept and then also looking towards the future with a station three and then uh, growth if needed uh, at the Thornhill site, but then also at Station 2 site as well. So we are primed uh, to grow with the township based on, on these current models. Thank you. Great. Did that answer your question, Matt? It did. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, could you bring the next uh, public commenter into the room, please? Thank you. Our next commenter is Jim Svalski. Okay, just came up to unmute. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Thanks, Jim. What's your What's your question or comment for us? Sure, absolutely. So first, of all, I want to thank Stephanie, Adam, Jim, and Ben for this evening and taking the time to present. I've greatly appreciated the transparency and the opportunity to participate in the planning and the sharing of information that you have. This goes back to 2018. So first, I have a comment and then two questions. 
Uh, first of all, participating back in 2018 with the initial planning, I remain then as I do now fully supportive of this project uh, moving forward. I think not being a firefighter, but just uh, going by the station, you can very easily see the constraint and the limitations of our current facility. Um, so we do need to grow with the time. So my report, my support remains unchanged. So to that end, uh, two questions. First, I am losing patience for all of us because I wanna see the new station. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess I asked the question to Ben, in the ideal state with the perfect scenario, when could we have that golden shovel that Adam is sticking into the ground and breaking ground? Um, the second question that I have is more minor, but I'm just curious, for mutual aid, when we can't cover certain areas like with Kentwood and what, do we pay for that uh, is my second question. My third was with growth, but you just answered that previously. Great, so I'm gonna ask Adam to answer the mutual aid question first, because that's the easiest one. Yeah, so no, with mutual aid, it, it is mutually beneficial. So as much as, as we rely on Kentwood and Ada and Caledonia, Dutton, Alto, Lowell, um, they also rely on us as well. So we, we do very much um, return the favor. And so there is no cost uh, whatsoever to, to provide those services, but then also to, to receive those services. So we're very fortunate that we've got great relationships with our neighbors. And uh, as much as they help us, we help them as well. So, so that part is uh, all mutual aid. If it was a paid service, that would be more of a, like an automatic aid contract or something like that. And we don't have any of those. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. So I'm going to ask Jim to answer the next question. And I'm going to put a couple caveats in here because it could be all over the place uh, based on if we need to go back to the drawing board from the presentation that was made tonight. But Jim, let's assume that we go through this process and we get to a township board meeting in March and the township board decides that they want to move forward uh, with the, the proposal that has been put forward. Can you tell us a little bit about what the, the timing will be to uh, develop the final plans, to solicit bids, uh, when the board might be actually be able to consider a, a bid and then what the construction might timeline might look like. Yeah, those are those are the considerations exactly right. And and in keeping in mind that we are in a, a time of COVID-19 that has affected project schedules, material availability, and project progress based on health of the workers. So we have seen that in the past eight months um, that has changed things. So with that in mind, uh, traditional process is for the township to approve the project to move to the schematic design phase. Uh, traditionally, you would, you would take approximately four or five months to design and detail and document the project uh, so that it could go out for bids. Um, once the bidding market has it, that is another month, uh, which would take us to month six or seven, depending on um, how aggressive uh, the township moves uh, with awarding contractors. Um, again, approvals at every step of the way does mean we introduce um, that review period at each phase uh, with approval to proceed. So um, the, an the short answer to your question after that, oh, those qualifications would be uh, late summer uh, shovel in the ground to early fall would be, uh, would be possible. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, in the construction time frame, a station like this, we would anticipate taking a year to, to build a station of this size. Great, thanks for that, uh, Jim. And thanks for the question and comment, Jim. We appreciate it. Uh, Stephanie, could you bring the next person into the comment room, please? Um, Manager Swayze, we do not have any more raised hands at this time. All right, Steph, could you review the questions and answers that were posed beforehand and see if there's any that uh, uh, we need to answer right now? Sure. Um, someone just asked how many people were on the webinar. Um, as of 610, there were 65. Um, There was a question as to what the population in Cascade would be at the time at which a third fire station would be needed. Yeah, so, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Chief to talk a little bit about that because the, the need for station three is based a little bit more on the ability uh, to respond to certain areas uh, rather than, you know, the exact population growth. So. 
Chief, could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so what we're looking at with station three someday, uh, right now we're monitoring every single call uh, that happens down there southwest of the airport. We monitor what it is, how long it takes us to get there, um, what the extent of it is, et cetera. We have automatic aid agreements in place with Kentwood and Caledonia and Dutton and Alto to get there as fast as they can. And we get there as fast as we can safely. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just not fast enough. Uh, it's, a, it's a seven to 10 minute response uh, to get fire apparatus or emergency personnel down to that area. The thing that is gonna drive uh, station three is, is several things. Uh, right now they're building apartments down there. Uh, you can, there the construction's already started. They've got about four years worth of construction, about 500 units. Uh, Lax Enterprises is, is, is building. You've got Davenport uh, University that's down there. You've got all kinds of industry. So we're estimating in the next four to five years that that that, that entire area is going to be full. And that as that area is full, it's going to have people living down there. It's going to generate more calls, uh, et cetera. So the more calls, the more people, the more incidents is going to drive that. There's a, there's a need right now for coverage. Um, but that need has to be balanced with the amount of calls relative to the rest of the township um, with the amount of people and citizens that are down there. So my estimate is in the next five years when that fills up, we're going to, we're going to be needing to have that answered. Um, so, and I, we've already had conversations with the township on what that potentially could look like. Um, when that happens, I'm not sure. I would think in the, in the next five to seven years, uh, we're going to have to have an answer and a program in place. That would be my guess. Yeah. And I guess I just would add to that too, Chief, that um, you know we haven't really even identified that Station Three is ultimately going to be the the, the solution down there. Uh, you know that Four Corners area is growing in all four of those communities. So it's growing in Kenwood, it's growing in Gaines, it's growing in Caledonia as well. Um, and the reach to that Four Corners area is going to eventually be an issue for all four of those communities. So there's no reason that four different communities would need to build four different fire stations in that area. Uh, we also have the airport down there that has its own fire department and could be a response partner. So, um, you know, part of that, that time frame in the next five to seven years is identifying even what the solution is to serve that area uh, before we start talking about uh, what a, a facility might look like. Great, uh, Steph, I guess I'm gonna go back to you and see if uh, it's, uh, the conversation has sparked any more interest among our attendees. No, sir, not at this time. All right, then I am going to take a moment again to thank everybody that came out uh, to hear the presentation tonight. Uh, I, I don't have to explain to you that this is a really important decision for uh, our residents, our fire department, our organization, uh, and we're really committed to uh, getting as much public input as possible as we go through this process. Uh, so again, if you uh, have neighbors or friends or people that weren't able to attend tonight, uh, encourage them to uh, go to our website uh, starting hopefully tomorrow. Steph, are we going to be able to have this posted tomorrow? Absolutely. Great. Uh, the survey is going to be on there, so if you had comments that you didn't want to make in uh, public that you want to fill out the survey, we'd certainly encourage you to do that. Again, that's all going to be part of the record uh, when this project eventually goes in front of the township board for consideration. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jim and Chief and Stephanie for uh, helping out tonight uh, and uh, sharing this information with the community. Uh, and behind the scenes, want to thank Hunter as well. Uh, and with that, Steph, I think we're going to sign off for the evening. Thank you, sir.